like loss of biodiversity, air and water pollution, and increased pressure on arable land. India supports 70% of the world's population on just 2.4% of the world's land area. Its current rate of population growth is 1.85%, according to the data provided by the government of India 2009, which continues to pose a persistent population challenge. The growing population poses some serious environmental threats. More people means less forest, water, soil, and other natural resources, but more waste pollution and greenhouse gases. And now I would like to humbly request our panel discussions for this panel discussion, Ms. Reva Molhotra, Communications Consultant India, to come up on stage and take your seat. Ms. Reva Malhotra, a round of applause for her, please. We also have Ms. Aisha Das Gupta, British High Commission, Nigeria. I'd also invite, like to invite Ms. Aisha Das Gupta to come up on stage and take her seat. A round of applause for her as well. We're delighted to have you all here. So now I would like to humbly request Ms. Riva Malhotra to start the conversation. Thank you. For you. Thank you. A very good afternoon to all present. I would start with a quick introduction of our esteemed panelists, Dr. Aishadas Gupta. Aisha Das Gupta is the Demography Advisor at the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office in Nigeria. Trained as a demographer at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, she previously worked for Mary Stopes International Columbia University and the United Nations. She has an interest in fertility, family planning measurement, and the population environment consumption nexus. Lady Das Gupta is a retired teacher and psychotherapist with a special interest in children, adolescent, and young adult mental health and well-being. She was on the board of management of Emans, a charity focused on supporting homeless men and women with training and accommodation. She draws, paints, and is also a creative writer. With a lifelong passion in gardening, if you don't find her at the High Commission, she can be found rewilding her gardens in the South Cambridge. May I request the tech team to start the presentation? Thank you. Maybe you can flick back to the beginning of the presentation. Well, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It really is a, an honor and a privilege for me to be able to join you uh, here today. Um, and special thanks to the Balapara Foundation and to the, uh, and to the university for including me. Um, because I'm neither an, an ecologist, nor am I uh, and uh, I'm neither an ecologist nor uh, an economist. Uh, I'm in fact a demographer. So I'm interested in the role that population plays in some of the issues that we've been talking about today. Um, I'm with the British High Commission based in Nigeria. And Nigeria uh, really stands out as different even compared to, to other countries of sub-Saharan Africa. The last region to be going through the demographic transition, meaning the change from a situation of high fertility and high mortality to a situation of low fertility and low mortality, uh, the countries furthest behind are concentrated now in sub-Saharan Africa. And even Nigeria stands out as uh, exceptional within sub-Saharan Africa. And this really is in contrast to a country like Bangladesh, which has really been the success story from a demography perspective. Uh, a country that some decades ago went through an incredibly quick demographic transition, um, thanks in part to a, a, a very impressive 
family planning program. So I'm going to talk about um, the sub-Saharan Africa experience with a particular focus on, on Nigeria. So let me uh, see how I can advance. Okay. So Nigeria, here we're taking a look at the, the map of Nigeria in West Africa. It's Africa's largest democracy and economy, and today is the world's sixth most populous country. Uh, and projections suggest that by the middle of the century, it will be the third largest country globally after India and China. Uh, it's uh, very diverse within Nigeria, different ethnic, cultural and linguistic groups. Um, with serious disparities in wealth and human development, with the northern states uh, lagging behind. The significant structural challenges, corruption is pervasive, um, the oil is benefiting really just the elite. But younger Nigerians are increasingly dissatisfied with the status quo, um, which really culminated in the NSARS movement of, of a couple of years ago. So with the demography perspective, um, I wanted to pull out a couple of uh, key projections for sub-Saharan Africa, um, that's the lower bars, and Nigeria, the, the upper bars. And red shows the situation today, and blue, the, situa the projected situation for 2050. And what's projected is um, really a substantial growth in the total population. So for sub-Saharan Africa, it's projected to grow from around a billion today to around two billion by the middle of the century, and for Nigeria, well, no one really knows the current population, but let's call it somewhere around 200 million people today and projected to reach somewhere around 400 million by the middle of the century. Fertility, so why, why are we projecting that increase in population size? It's really all because of high fertility, which is the main driver of that growth in population. So... In terms of the fertility rate, which is the average number of births per woman, uh, in Nigeria still experiencing well over five births per woman. Um, and who knows, really, it all depends how quickly the transition happens. But let's uh, assume that it will be roughly around three births per woman by the middle of the century. And it's also projected that be, there'll be some in, increases in life expectancy. So what... I'm now going to just whiz through a few slides, which will take a look at what are the implications of this uh, demographic change, most especially growth in population size. Um, what are the implications for a number of sectors? So starting at human capital formation, I want to make the point that the progress that's been seen in health has, is quite impressive and, um, and should continue. But there are much larger problems for education. So in terms of the human development context today, we're taking a look at three maps here. And on the left, we're taking a look at total fertility. So again, the average number of births per woman, um, which on average is just over five, but with significant differences. So the highest number of births per woman um, are occurring in the northern states um, and, and lower in the southern states. In the middle, we're taking a look at stunting, but I could have picked any other health indicator here. We see that the, 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 the ind whatever the indicator, they tend to do worse amongst the northern states um, and on the right, we're taking a look at the number of out-of-school girls um, with the highest numbers in the northern states. So in terms of demographic projections that are of special interest to health and education, I've taken a look at the total number of births per year, the population of under fives, and the school-age population, so roughly five to 19. And the reason for my interest in these is because, of course, births require um, antenatal, materni maternity, obstetric um, care services. Children under the age of five have demands on the health sector in particular, vaccinations and so on. Um, and school age population have, uh, you know, are, are, of course, importance for the education sector. So again, we're seeing that even though we're anticipating a, a decline in fertility, however slow or fast that happens, we're still expecting to see a growth in the numbers of um, people in these particular age categories, which is going to have substantial consequences for um, the need for maternal and child care health services, um, education, uh, sexual and reproductive health care services, and so on. So trends in under five mortality since the middle of um, the last century. Um, we're taking a look at Nigeria in green and sub-Saharan Africa as a whole in purple. So you can really see that with a demographer's perspective, there's been 
incredibly uh, incredible declines in under five mortality, which is a good thing. And that's really thanks to the sort of basic healthcare um, interventions like hand washing, bed nets, um, antibiotics, and so on. That's really caused the declines in, in child mortality. But it's a slightly bleaker picture when we take a look at education. So here um, we're looking at South Asia in, in orange um, and Sub-Saharan Africa in purple. So for Sub-Saharan Africa, yes, you can see that there's been some modest um, increases in, in primary education on the left um, and in secondary education on the right, but you can still see some serious gaps here. But the number of teachers that would be needed to achieve universal primary and secondary education in sub-Saharan Africa by the end of the SDG period, so by 2030, is going to be quite substantial. So in order to achieve universal primary education, sub-Saharan Africa would need over 6 million additional teachers. And in order to achieve universal secondary education, uh, sub-Saharan Africa would need um, nearly 11 million teachers by 2030. Um, so, I mean, within just, you know, just a handful of years. But just to, just to try and match population increase, so even forgetting trying to achieve anything about universal um, education, so just to sort of match the population increase, the number of primary school teachers would need to increase from today's 4.6 million to over 7 million teachers by 2050. And for secondary school teachers, it would need to see an increase from 2.9 million to 4.9 million teachers by the middle of a century. So it's just trying to make the case that there's going to be this you know, massive race to try and keep up with the growth of population, let alone try and make any dent on universal education. And what of quality? So here these charts are taking a look at the percentage of teachers that are um, fully trained, so are qualified teachers. And we're taking a look at trends by region since 2000, and the purple lines, which are the bottom lines, are looking at sub-Saharan Africa. And what we're seeing both for primary on the left, but also for secondary school education on the, on the right, is you're seeing really a decline in the proportion of teachers who are actually qualified. And it's really speaking to the fact that there's this increase in use of contract, unqualified teachers that are being used. So this is really sort of making the case that, you know, while there's the race to try and, and provide enough teachers for the growth in population, it's likely that there's going to become an even further cost to quality education. We already know that the quality of education, the quality of learning outcomes is very poor with high numbers of children, of those children who are attending school um, still coming out um, illiterate um, and without the sort of learning outcomes that we'd wish to see. So now taking a quick look at um, the impact of population growth for employment, livelihoods, and urbanization. So in Nigeria, um, there's already um, high unemployment levels, roughly around a third, of which um, the highest burden is amongst youth. Taking a look at the group, the, the population group of roughly 20 to 64, it's projected to increase from today's 89 million to just shy of 200 million by the middle of the century. So massive growth in the working age population. For Nigeria alone, um, it's it, in order to sort of keep up with uh, um, this, the, the, the rapid population growth, nearly 5 million jobs would need to be created each year to keep up with that, with that population growth. There's also a trend um, in sub-Saharan Africa towards urbanization. So each year, um, there's an additional 27 million people living in urban areas in sub-Saharan Africa. And for Nigeria, the proportion urban is around half today, but by the middle of the century, it's anticipated to be around two thirds. So I guess, you know, the uh, urban areas are likely to sort of, um, you know, that's where there, there may be more economic opportunities. But will, you know, will sectors like manufacturing sectors be able to, to, to race to sort of keep up with um, that growth in, in population. This map on the right uh, with these circles, this is taking a look um, at uh, urban populations. So the size of each, um, the size of each circle is the, the urban population. So you can see, um, I'm not sure if I can point, no, I don't think so, but you can see on the left, the largest circle is for Nigeria. So that's the, the, the urban population. But the orange, the darker orange color there, 
is the proportion of the urban population that's living in slum conditions. So you can see that for Nigeria, already two-thirds of the population that are living in urban areas are living in, in slum conditions. So with this increased urbanization, we can really anticipate that the, the pressures from population growth in urban areas are really going to be relentless. And what that means in terms of the, um, things like conflict and violence and social cohesion, um, you know, there'll be some serious consequences there. So now to moving to um, food security and, and, and what will be the sorts of challenges in feeding um, populations that will roughly double in size. So the prevalence of undernourishment um, in Nigeria and, and in West Africa is uh, just over 14% um, and it's thought to be rising. Um, three quarters of Nigerians are relying on agriculture for their income. But producti productivity is quite static. So the yields per, ha per hectare are static. And this is really because of um, inadequate input use, so um, lack of hybrid seeds, lack of fertilizer. And most agriculture is, um, and food crops are still um, tend to be rain-fed. So in sub-Saharan Africa, 97% um, of food crops are rain-fed and not irrigated. And um, in parts of um, um, sub-Saharan Africa, up to 20% of cereals um, are still imported. So I've put here that further extension of culti cultivated land might be possible in some countries, so potentially Democratic Republic of Congo, Mozambique, Angola. But limits have been reached in many, and, and with what environmental consequences um, if there were to be further extensions? So can sub-Saharan Africa more than double the food availability in the next 30 years? Um, the, I think the key point is that there's need for productivity improvements rather than um, any further expansion of land under cultivation. Some of the constraints might be remedied. So, for example, infrastructure um, and improved storage and markets, so um, particularly cold storage uh, and water capture and storage and so on. But the current agricultural practices and the growing um, agricultural rural population is leading to an overexploitation of fragile land um, and further soil degradation and erosion. Farm sizes are likely to become um, even smaller, making it harder for um, producing enough crop crops for, for selling. And some of the challenges as well around insecurity of tenure, of, of land tenure, um, is making a sort of a, a disin disincentive to invest in longer term improvements. So environment, um, and I want to talk about the global versus the, the local, local um, perspective. So <clears throat> Africa's current contribution to global climate change, of course, is, is negligible, um, but potentially has a larger impact in the long run in the future from both, both in, in population and in consumption. The growth in the rural population and the need to more than double food production has serious consequences for environment and biodiversity at the local level, and most especially for, the, for consequences for the future people living in those areas. So the key point will be around raising yields rather than extending land under cult cultivation. Um, I've, I know that some speakers have already spoken about the, um, the, the concept of the ecological footprint and the estimates coming out of the global footprint network. Um, Nigeria, in fact, while having a very low per capita impact, in fact, is the 18th largest total ecological footprint um, globally, um, in part because of the large population size of Nigeria. I also just wanted to make a few comments on um, the, the, the linkage between population and um, uh, a, a conflict, um, because this is becoming an increasing issue for, for Nigeria. And even in the, even in the um, couple of years that I've been based in Nigeria, I've even seen a change. So of course, violence is um, triggered by many factors, um, uh, political, uh, um, economic, and so on. But I do want to make a, a, a small point around the ro role of population. Um, so the combination of both rapid population growth and environmental degradation, food insecurity, and the increased competition for resources um, is likely to see an increase in the risk of conflict and in anti-government uh, sympathies. So in Nigeria, um, one of the sort of uh, issues that's sort of ongoing is this conflict between um, uh, farmer and herder uh, pastoralist communities. 
that's that's been seen. Um, instability and conflict uh, used to be concentrated really in the in the very southern states, um, but also in the northeastern states. Um, uh, around Boko Haram, um, now Islamic State of West Africa. But that instability is now sort of being seen in other parts of Nigeria as well, including the Northwest, which is really an emerging crisis. Um, also happens to have, um, the, the Northwest region happens to have the highest fertility rate, so with 6.6 um, .6 births on average, um, with some states, uh, Jagawa, for example, exceeding 7.3 births or higher. So still extremely high levels of fertility. And as well, we see conflicts between um, sedentary and moving populations, um, really around um, increased competition for land, um, particularly influenced because of desertification, particularly in the northern states, um, and the need to move further south and move um, herd, um, herds uh, further south. Um, and, and as well, there's a lot of uh, cross-border um, movements of people between uh, Niger, uh, Chad, uh, Cameroon, because of desertification and environmental stresses. So you see um, movements of populations, um, particularly moving further south, um, which you know, creates conflicts between the sedentary populations. And now the middle belt of Nigeria is sort of a, um, an emerging crisis as well. So one of the thoughts is that with a, um, a larger pool of um, young people, um, particularly vulnerable people with few economic opportunities, um, with poor education outcomes, um, the, the, the thinking is that it lowers the cost of recruitment for rebel groups, um, which is well contributing to some of the instability seen. So I, I wanted just to say a few words about um, population and the um, Nigerian political economy, which is incredibly complex. And I still feel like I'm, I'm sort of just trying to understand the, the, the situation. Um, population numbers in Nigeria uh, influence um, both political representation, but also influence the share that states get from the federal budget allocations. So sort of think of this in terms of if I were a governor of a state, why would I be incentivized in trying to address the population of my state when I'm going to benefit from a larger population, either because I get you know, larger political representation or I'm going to be able to grab a larger share of the federal budget. So the incentives just aren't there. And for um, politicians, they tend to remain very, very silent on population because to make po uh, comments on fertility, which is an incredibly sensitive issue, or to make comments on population is really political suicide. So as a result, politicians don't really like to, to get involved in the issue. I don't think I'm really, I have time to sort of comment on the El Marjorie system, um, but maybe in the discussion afterwards I could come back to it. But I, I just wanted to sort of point to other sort of structural factors in Nigeria, which are really promoting high fertility and make the move towards um, ad addressing high fertility quite challenging. And the Child Rights Act um, of the 2010s was um, an example of, again, some of the complications around uh, population and the challenges and, and conflicts between states in, in Nigeria. Um, some of the states in the north adopted um, the Child Rights Act, um, trying to sort of make a, um, uh, to trying to demonstrate the, the, the progressive move towards some of the elements of, of this Child Rights Act. Um, uh, so, for example, um, uh, the, the minimum age of, of marriage, making the minimum age of 18 to address child marriage. But other states rejected that, that part in particular because it was seen as a, um, an, a Western um, a, a liberal agenda. And it was really a sort of um, you know, a rejection both um, to that, but also to the other states who had um, uh, adopted it. So it's really sort of an example of some of the culture wars within, within Nigeria. Maybe I'll come back to the census later if there's time. I wanted just to, this is my final slide. Um, I wanted to um, hopefully send, uh, end on a slightly more positive note. Um, the population projections that I was presenting in the earlier parts of the pr uh, presentation were all um, population projections, just picking the, the median projection. But one of the nice things about the UN population projections is that they don't offer just the median projection. They also produce pro uh, population projections with uncertainty. Um, so giving a sort of upper and lower likely um, uh, bound for, for all of the demographic um, projections that I've, I've shown. 
And one of the ways that I like to think about that uncertainty, um, and I should say that uncertainty is all driven by, um, it, it, it's all explained by uh, the examples of countries that have gone through demographic transitions and understanding what those patterns of both mortality decline um, and fertility decline look like. So um, the, the examples and experiences of a country like Bangladesh and, and many other countries in Asia and Latin and America and the Caribbean are informing how the transitions of sub-Saharan Africa might look like. So the way that I like to look at the uncertainty, and so here this is a, um, the projections um, of total population for Nigeria. The middle line is the median projection. So going from roughly 200 million today to roughly 400 million by the middle of the century. And the uncertainty, those gray lines, the upper and the lower, is making the point that with 95% certainty, the population will probably be somewhere between 300 million and uh, 480 million people by the middle of the century. And I like to use that uncertainty because it's really saying that it all depends on what sort of policies and what sort of actions are taking now, um, most especially around fertility, and um, will determine whether the population is at the higher or the lower end of, the, of that uncertainty interval. So if the wrong uh, policy, if, if, you know, if there's no policy actions and no uh, you know, actions taken now, um, the population you know, could very well look uh, to be heading towards half a billion people by the middle of the century. Alternatively, if Nigeria um, you know, prioritizes population, um, you know, learns from the lessons of, uh, of countries that have gone through uh, demographic transitions earlier um, and, and quicker, um, it's very possible that the population may be closer to 300 million people by the end, by the middle of the century, sorry. Um, and likely, you know, I hope my presentation as well has, has tried to make the point that the, you know, whether the population hits the lower or the upper end of that uncertainty interval is likely to have consequences for all of the sectors that, that I've covered. So let me stop there. Um, thank you. I would like to um, request our tech people so that we can have connections to our microphones, please. Thank you, Dr. Aisha, for such an insightful presentation. And while you were presenting, I was just thinking of certain concerns that, um, that can come up in a place like Nigeria, which is so demographically, religiously, uh, you know, bifurcated and sure. complex and led. So what are the challenges that, uh, that you would face in a place like this? Um, and if you can relate the same to the Bangladesh experience and learnings from there. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, Nigeria is, uh, you know, incredibly diverse. Um, predominantly uh, uh, Muslim in the north, predominantly Christian in the south. Um, you know, and, and I mean, that's sort of a broad summary, but it's not, you know, it's not quite like that, but also with Christian populations in the north and, and Muslims in the south as well. Um, so yeah, incredible diversity throughout the country. Um, but there, you know, there, there are a number of commonalities as well. Um, and, and you know, one, one commonality that I would uh, point to is that you know, dis despite the sort of statistics that I've um, described, 
there is still an incredibly high, what I'd call unmet need for family planning. So, um, you know, very large proportions of women um, are not using uh, um, contraception, but don't wish to, uh, to don't wish to be pregnant or don't wish to have another pregnancy. Um, and you know, this is a uh, this is a neglected area, um, and re you know, really speaks to the importance of um, of family planning and the need for family planning um, programs in in Nigeria. So, there's roughly around. Um, 10 million pregnancies a year in Nigeria, and it's estimated that around a quarter of those are unintended. So, so it really speaks to the, um, the need for family planning services. Um, but in terms of the, you know, the diversity within, within Nigeria um, and the sort of the discourse around population and the, the sensitivities around population and family planning, you know, it would be important for any family planning program to sort of, um, you know, to be adapted based on the, the needs of the particular local population. So, you know, in some communities, um, you know, you, you better not talk about family planning, but it might be okay to talk about birth spacing and birth spacing for um, the health of mother and the health of child. And that might be a more acceptable way. But, you know, with, with the um, diversity within country, you know, th these sorts of programs would need to be adapted based on the, on the needs of the, the individual populations. Do you see any shared opportunities and challenges with Bangladesh? Because often these countries are compared in terms of uh, the crisis that they're undergoing. And uh, Bangladesh has definitely made a headway with many of them at a policy level and uh, at an opportunity level. So your comments on that. Yeah. Um I, I, so I was actually just taking a look at the population projections for both Nigeria and um, Bangladesh and sort of looking at some of the similarities and, and differences. And one thing that struck me is that actually the, the population um, was actually the same in Niger for Nigeria and Bangladesh not that long ago. It was only 15 years ago that the population size was um, the same. Whereas for Bangladesh, you know, which has gone through a, um, you know, an, an incredibly quick demographic transition, the, the the population for projections for Bangladesh looks so different when I then take a look at the population projections for Nigeria. So whilst uh, having a, a, a similar population size not that long ago, you know, Nigeria is just, um, you know, is still growing incredibly, incredibly quickly. Um, I've, I've since I've, I've had a number of interesting meetings and conversations in the past days that I've I've been here, and one of the things that really struck me um, when I asked uh, some of my colleagues at the um, at the British High Commission here um, and uh, colleagues at UNFPA um, here, and I asked about what's the budget for family planning um, in Bangladesh? What does it look like today? Um, and they explained to me that uh, so for a five-year period. Um, the budget for family planning um, in Bangladesh was 600 and I can't remember exactly something like 625 million um, for over five years for family planning, and I, I nearly fell off my chair because um, it's a completely different story for for Nigeria. I couldn't quite believe it. Um, in Nigeria, so uh, I mean, for many years. Yeah. Um, for Nigeria, there was uh, there was no spend on family planning for for the longest time. Um, as part of uh, Family Planning 2020, which was a partnership, a movement that started in in some ten years ago in 2012, um, at a, the London Summit on Family Planning, which was uh, led by the the UK government and and the Gates Foundation, started this partnership, um, and. Um, it included um, commitments uh, both from donor countries and, and um, a number of countries globally uh, to family planning. Um, 
And at that point, uh, the UK started um, sort of an annual spend of roughly three to four million pounds per year on family planning, which um, leveraged financing from the, the Nigeria government, which then started committing to family planning. So for a number of years, there was around um, four million dollars uh, per year spent by the UK, uh, sorry, by the Nigerian government on family planning commodities. But sadly, that, um, that, that sort of gone, gone, gone down. Um, most re this most recent year, 2022, um, in the health budget, uh, so the total health budget, not only was there zero for family planning, the family planning line in the budget didn't exist, so it, it wasn't even there. Um, so when I hear of 625 million um, over a five-year period uh, spent on on family planning in Bangladesh and compare it to the Nigeria situation in terms of what it looks like in commitment to sexual and reproductive health. It's just, it's, it's, it's quite stark and, and quite depressing. Um, but yeah, I mean, let me just finish then with a, a final thought in terms of the, the, um, the opportunities between the two. Um, we have a small program in um, in Nigeria, a demography program that we we work uh, closely with the World Bank on, um, which is around um, capacity building on on demographic issues with um, predominantly with the government of Nigeria. Um, so uh, advocacy activities and, and capacity buildings and supporting the the Nigerian ministries to work together, ministries that are um, you know relate to the demography agenda, so be it health or education, um, the, the um, women um, and so on. Um, one of the activities, uh, well, there's been a number of activities under it, including um, trainings for journalists and, and those working in the media to be able to better report on issues of relevance to demography and population. So this is what, one of the activities that's been going on. Um, but one of the ambitions under this uh, demography program that we have is to put together a, um, a a delegation from Nigeria um, to come on a study tour to um, Bangladesh. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, I, I think you know the idea is really to sort of learn uh, from the experiences of a country that that you know that is really the poster child in terms of demographic transition. Um, you know, also a, a predominantly Muslim country. Um, you know, to, to better understand sort of, for, for example, engagement with um, religious leaders. Um, uh, and you know, understand how you know how the family planning program was rolled out. You know, why, why was population um, taken seriously? Um, what did the communication activities look like? I, you know, I understand that TV, uh, radio shows played an important uh, played an important part. Um, I think those lessons will be quite you know, valuable for a country like Nigeria, which is, you know, still in the early stages of the, the demographic transition. Um, you know, maybe it won't look quite the same. Maybe it won't be radio shows or TV programs. But, uh, you, you know, Nigeria has a, you know, Nollywood is huge. Um, and, you know, social media influences may be, you know, maybe the sort of communication channel. You know, I don't know exactly how it might look like for, for Nigeria. Um, but you know, another similarity perhaps is that um, you know it's not just government and um, you know sort of non-traditional actors, the, the traditional leaders, um, the religious leaders are likely to uh, be a really important part of the the puzzle for for um, Nigeria. So I think I think you know lessons and understandings from the the, the Bangladesh experience could be could be very valuable to um, a delegation coming from from Nigeria. Great. I guess if we have to summarize, then it has to be around budget allocation, uh, taking all stakeholders into consideration while formulating a policy and contextualizing it. And of course, you know, a very significant part is relaying the right messages through the right medium. And that's where the role of communication also steps in. Thank you, Dr. Aisha. Due to paucity of time, we'll not be in a position to take up questions from the audience, but uh, feel free to catch her offline and uh, speak to her. Yeah. Thank you. So 
A heartfelt thanks to our panel discussants for their beautiful message and refreshing speech. At this point, um, I would like